Welcome to the Alchemist Manifesto, a podcast with Mario Ando and Daniel Topete. We're two friends holding space and making time to have holistic and humanizing platicas and charlas with the aim of alchemizing our individual experiences and to shared healing and wisdom. The amistad that produces this podcast emerges from our shared commitment to social justice as teachers and scholars in the fields of critical and relational ethnic studies, and of course, our creative and everyday efforts to imagine better worlds with our loved ones, communities, and spirits. Rather than a conventional written manifesto, our podcast welcomes you to an evolving, living, and breathing journey rooted in the beauty of alchemy through amistad and palabras, cuentos and testimonios that emerge in this sacred ceremony of bringing our spirits together and transmitting them with you. We channel a welcome via the spirit of learning and teaching as we seek a path to our true selves. May our bodies and minds be open and curious to multiple realities, multiple thoughts, multiple practices, all while seeking a balance in our worlds. May we be open to the beauty and complexities of our individual universe and feel the responsibility of our collective spiritual ecosystems. Y respiramos vida a las palabras del jaguar Saul Hernández. Hay que comprender y unirse a todas las cosas que son de la tierra. Empezar y comprender el equilibrio que está alrededor de nosotros y aprender a ver, y aprender a ver, y aprender a ver. May every spiritual and ancestral energy that tunes in here feel the frequencies of love and liberation we vibrate out in this alchemist manifesto. Sending love and peace your way to everyone who's listened to the podcast. It's been inspiring to see folks who are listening and who are playing the podcast. We've really sent it out to, to you know, friends, family, uh, students who uh, we're connected to and close to. And the reception has been really positive. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who's listened. It's been really, it's been really grounding. Um, it's been very much uh, part of why Danny and I are even doing this podcast. Uh, so I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for listening to our Getting to Know Us episodes. It's been very uh, humbling uh, to to think about how many folks have been uh, listening to to us through this, through this platform. I still think about why we Mario and I decided to do this and, and, and sharing this space with you all has been very healing for me as well. It's been uh, a part of this process to, to know that, that folks have been so supportive in creating this community for, with us um, and, and to be a part of this journey to, to just reimagine right, uh, our spaces around us uh, that can often be negative, can, also, can be traumatic, right? can be a lot of different things, right? And, and for us to reshift, right? the focus a little bit right? and to be able to to learn and, and, and heal from those uh, uh, experiences in, in ways that, you know, to be honest, I don't think are very broadcast and promoted in our societies, right? Um, these things are seen as weakness. These things are seen as vulnerability in, in a weak way, right? And, and we, we hope that, uh, you know, us at least sharing some of these um, can, can inspire uh, and keep inspiring us, us through to, to continue this. So thank you very much. Absolutely. And in that spirit, um, welcome to another episode of the Alchemist Manifesto. Um, I'm Mario Alberto Oando. Um, joined here, of course, with um, my best friend, uh, Danny Topete. Um, we definitely have been thinking about this podcast as, as a kind of chronicling of where we are in the present moment of what we're up to. And this week, one of the things that's been very central to us uh, has been gearing up for another semester, as well, of course, with uh, the variety of things that are taking place in the world. Uh, there was an inauguration on Wednesday that's been kind of present in sort of our cultural critiques of, of things. Uh, but we wanted to do an episode 
on teaching and gearing up for teaching and what parts of ourselves uh, we bring into the space of the classroom. As many of you are uh, know, the spring semester has either started for some of you, is about to start. Uh, some of you um, are students. Uh, some of you are teachers like ourselves. Some of you are parents. Um, some of you are family members. And, um, you know, Danny and I are kind of across a lot of those lines, right? We're both teachers. Uh, and that's been kind of a central piece of our episode planning today, thinking about the importance of, of planning, pre preparing, and, and also more importantly, uh, how we think about teaching. In the, in the getting to know us episode, particularly the one with Danny, there was this kind of conversation about trauma and how it informs our teaching. And we talked about alchemizing our trauma as kind of really important lessons for life, but also really important uh, ways of knowing and ways of being of how we begin to occupy this occupy the space of the classroom and we're going to dedicate this episode to fleshing that out a little bit more right bringing our spirit our body and mind uh, to think about you know how do we optimize our traumas and make them spaces of healing in our classrooms so it's in that spirit that we have a few questions that we're going to ask each other and that are going to be the focus of our podcast episode today. Uh, the first one, I'm going to throw it Danny's way. What parts of yourself and why do you introduce to students as you're gearing up for really the second semester fully online during a global pandemic, right? Where there are over 400,000 people who have, who have passed, so many people who are suffering. And, you know, we're in this moment where connection is really important. So Danny, I'm just I'm wondering what parts of yourself and why do you introduce to students? For me, uh, teaching at the same school that I actually was a student, I did my bachelor's and my master's in uh, now uh, Chicana, Chicana, Latino, Latino studies at Cal State LA. And now teaching in that same department at the same school has really al allowed me to reflect um, the student's experience, right, as a former student myself, to really think about, you know, myself as a reflection of them, instead of just having that teacher-student relationship that has been very, you know, documented and very researched, right? I use, you know, a lot of work from like Paulo Freire and, right, the Brazilian educators, pedagogy, right, to think about Right. How is it that I can create a space for students to share parts of themselves, right, and and really contribute to their own education? And for me, putting myself out there, telling my story to them, being vulnerable, right, I feel creates a better learning environment, right, to say, you know what, maybe my path is unconventional, right, maybe my path isn't formulated exactly like you know it has been said and you know saved by the bell and all these shows right that it's like you know every step right is is so you know fluid and you might have some little you know obstacles here and there but you're right you make it you make it to the top right in in, in a very effortless way that has not been my experience right my experience has not been effortless i i feel like you know, it took me a while to figure out how to be a student. And I feel like a lot of the folks who are, you know, in, in, in those seats are just like me and have similar experiences as me, as first generation college students, right? Trying to navigate these spaces that often are kind of like sink or swim, right? Are like, figure it out or don't like, you know, and even then, I, you know, I, as I kind of reflect, it's like there are services, there are things out there that can help students like find that path. But even then, trying to find that office, right, can be very difficult as well, right? So, you know, it, it seems like uh, the more and more I think about my position, I try to think of myself as a guide. Uh, I try to think of myself as, you know, somebody who has learned from a lot of mistakes and had to learn from my mistakes, right? To to continue to to uh, find my way through these spaces. 
right? I try to think of myself as as a, as a reflection of the students themselves, right? And now, right, um, having gone through those traumas, right? I think I talked a little bit before in the other episodes about spunking kindergarten. I barely graduated high school. It took me like six years to get out of a community college. When I started applying for PhD programs, I didn't get accepted the first year to anywhere I applied, right? And those things became very traumatic and devastating, right? For me, since, you know, that first flunking of kindergarten, right? My relationship to education has been very fakey. And I think that has really informed the way that I continue to navigate in these spaces, questioning myself till the cows come home, like they say, right? Every, like, when I write a sentence, I question it and try to like, you know, be constructed and say, does this make sense? Like constantly doubting myself. And I know that's a part of this process of that trauma that a lot of folks have gone through because they're still trying to learn how to navigate in these spaces. And with that same kind of relationship that I've been trying to have with myself, I'm also trying to take that into the classroom. Being kind and being generous and being the things that I want to be to myself, take it easy on myself, right? You know, if you're having a hard day, it's like, okay, there are other things that are more important right now. Like, take take a breath, right? And I try to do that with my students. I, I've been trying to do that with my students more and more. Again, as I see myself as a reflection of, of my students as well, as to say, like, what kind of space, what kind of community am I trying to build here? And they are, they are a part of my community. I grew up here, I live here, and I don't wanna be so caught up in that teacher-student kind of like, oh, there's there's gotta be like that kind of like hard, stark relationship. I don't believe that. And I wanna really think about, especially right now during this pandemic, I wanna think about, you know, how their day is, right? I want to know like, hey, you know what, like, these are very different circumstances and i hope that this this kind of relationship that i that i'm trying to foster uh between teacher student uh continues you know after this pandemic i hope it ends someday but as we go back to the classroom to think about like you know what like especially for these for first generation college students these spaces have been traumatic for a very long time right before this pandemic I think the pandemic has highlighted and you know kind of brought more of these things to the surface, but they've always been there. And I think you know to think about right how we begin to develop that relationship to education, specifically here, right? As instructors, as instructors who have gone through this process, just like there are right now, to be like. There's, there should be a different way. And hopefully we can continue that as we head out, hopefully head out of this pandemic. What about yourself? What do you introduce here to your students? That what you're saying there, Danny, to me is uh, is really critical, right? Because imposter syndrome in many ways, what, what folks call imposter syndrome, right? Imposter syndrome in many ways can be alchemized, right? That it might actually be something critical to think about why we feel this way, why we feel like we don't belong in a space. I actually think that there's something kind of productive and generative and thinking critically about imposter syndrome, right? For me, and I talk about this a lot with students and also with you, Danny, is like imposter syndrome is uh, you don't feel entitled to a space. And that's not necessarily saying that students shouldn't feel entitled to spaces, but to think about what that means. Um, what emerges out of feeling like you don't belong in a space. That means that we're perhaps looking for other folks to build community with. Uh, that perhaps um, that kind of sense of not sureness, that sense of, of, am I even supposed to be here? We're all feeling that. And I think hearing right your story, Danny, in particular, both in the episode uh, uh, about getting to know us, but also right now and is critical. It's to say, I feel nervous. I feel anxious about being here. Let's do this together, right? And that we're not all alone 
in that individual experience of imposter syndrome. And I think that's something that, you know, I think about a lot, this idea that imposter syndrome is an individualized experience. When we are vulnerable in the classroom, as Danny's describing, I think with that imposter syndrome, we collectivize that trauma and we alchemize it into a productive kind of fabric that we can all kind of, you know, weave into our own little comfy blankets that we can all kind of, uh, you know, have that material cover us in the class together. But to answer that question, you know, I think what parts of myself do I introduce to students? As the years have gone on, I think I've got, I've tried to kind of really get to the core of, uh, of myself and to share it. We're not around very long in this life. And, and I think all of our flaws, all of our errors, all of our mistakes, and all of our strengths and all of our, uh, you know, our, our the generative things that have gone in our lives, as we're sort of, uh, as none of us are unscathed by the systems of violence that unfortunately we all kind of have to navigate. Uh, I try to like think about my life as a kind of, as a, as a guidebook um, that I'm learning from. And I don't have the answer. I don't have like the gameplay or I don't have the answers to the plays, right? But that I'm just trying to kind of figure out. Um, I tell students all the time when I start the semester that I really think of this class as a love letter to myself at 17, 18 years old. What is, what does Mario <laughs> at 17 or 18 need to know? Uh, and so that's where, that's where all that comes into, right? That kind of politics that comes out of women of color feminism of Chicana and Latina feminism, of the personal is political and the political is personal, that used to be kind of, for me, intellectualized a little bit. The more I've worked on myself and really unpacked and, and really kind of gone to what's going on and why I'm even an, a scholar activist in the first place, uh, sharing that from the beginning of what that answer is, uh, why, I, why I have this level of sensitivity from the very beginning um, is something that I want students to know. And that love letter is my syllabus, which doesn't look like a dear student. <laughs> I wish it did. That'd be kind of nice that you get to the syllabus says why each reading is, is beautiful. So I try to articulate that within the confines of that document. Um, but, uh, you know, everything means something to me. Um, and, you know, for me, I think when I figured out why I was so sensitive, why I was so hurt by other people being hurt, right? Whether that is state sanctioned violence as a result of colonialism, genocide, war, slavery, segregation, and all of those legacies playing out in our contemporary context. Um, for me, it was the fact that um, I'm a victim of childhood sexual violence. And uh, I talk about that from the, from the jump. And that's what got me into uh, you know, therapy. That's what got me into thinking about the dynamics of my life and, and why I even do this stuff in the first place. And I think knowing the answer to that or having a sense of why you're in these spaces at the core of who you are, right? Why was I attuned to social justice from a er very early age? That's, a, that's not an easy thing to actually get to like why do we why are we attracted why are the, why in the law of attraction right why are we attracted to social justice and why are some folks not attracted to that and i think i had this wound that that uh to be honest you know something happened to me when i was seven and and i that that unearthed itself 20 years later uh and i really try to talk about that in my classes um, as a way to think about our personal stories and our lived experience as forms of connection, as not just like indulgent, but forms of connection in the class. So students, if you're going to ask students to be vulnerable in the class, right, you have to be vulnerable first, right? It's almost like kind of modeling that, but, but not just doing it because it's a teaching strategy, but because that is what, what social justice is. And so I, I try to reveal my relationship to healing, to therapy, uh, that, that I'm taking care of myself and I'm gonna do everything I can to take care of their stories, uh, their journeys. And for me, it's alchemizing that violence that I experienced that kept me silent and really trying to 
you know, go to school and like, you like be like, all right, I got to learn everything about social justice without ever really working on myself. And so I kind of like now it's like alchemizing my own personal story of, of violence uh, into this kind of form of connection. And then all the tools that I've gathered in, in that journey, which are, you know, a, maybe this was this happened about almost a year ago. I, I have it in a journal. It's early February of last year, right, right, right when the pandemic was about was gearing up and I wasn't that you know, aware of it, but my therapist asked me a question. Um, what are, what are you feeling? What are your emotions? And I was like, what can you, I have heard, I, I know how to articulate that, but what are the, you know, kind of dynamic, what, what is a, why are you asking me that? Right. Cause and she kept saying, you keep saying, you keep saying, I think a lot and you don't have, I feel statements. Uh, and so one thing that I share with my students is one of those tools is like checking in with your five emotions, right? When do you feel angry? When do you feel sad? When do you feel happy? When do you feel envious slash disgusted? When do you feel afraid? That to me has changed my life drastically. And so as you mentioned, Danny, you know, what's going on in their day, I try to start my classes with that wellness check-in, which is that's one of the many but also, you know, checking in with your senses, right? Like, you know, your six senses, your sense of taste, your sense of um, smell, your sense of, you know, all these other senses that help you ground yourself in what you're feeling, what you're sensing, uh, and bringing you back into your body beyond the kind of, I'm a student and I have to perform these things. No, you're, you're a spirit that has a body and that spirit and body need need that kind of watering and nurturing right and and i think those tools that i've that i've been working on whether it's those two things i mentioned or journaling or checking in with with them about the importance of meditation and offering that as another tool is part of that alchemy for me that alchemy of of taking our traumas into activities that maybe they could learn from too and making my individual stuff community based definitely i feel like one of the big realizations about my teaching had to be i mean when we went to grad school right it was like oh they're training us to be teachers but that didn't really that wasn't really the case i feel i, I think it was more about teaching us how to be writers and how to be academics in that sense so the the teaching part i felt was kind of like figure it out right find that voice which i'm okay with as well right um but i felt like in the beginning you know when i first started those voices and that narrative of my head about what the teacher was right was really informed by those traumas and those traumatic you know experiences of teachers that you know had done that to me and, and so i felt like i was replicating that that style of teaching and I was not happy, right? I was not happy about it. It made me feel miserable. It made me feel like I didn't want to go to work, right? And um, it made me feel like, what? why did I do, you know, this if this isn't what, you know, this isn't what I envisioned it was going to make me feel, right? And, and I definitely think that as I began to reflect on what was happening in my in my mind in my body right in my spirit that i began to let some of that guard down i felt like i was very guarded right i didn't want to let the students in you know and when i was teaching in minnesota i felt like that, that way as well and i also feel like you know i was a brand new teacher teaching chicano studies to majority white folk and, and it, it you know it kind of made me feel that imposter syndrome, right? Reading Eden's book, right, where she talks about those experiences about teaching as well. Obviously, I was a man, so I was, I, you know, I did have that privilege of my masculinity um, not being questioned the way that, you know, you know, cisgendered women or what have you are not questioned in the classroom. Um, but I definitely feel like, you know, I, I, I was kind of, my identity myself was magnified right um, i felt like that in minnesota all the time right even walking into a restaurant it's like oh shoot what is this person doing here right and 
Maybe it wasn't true. Maybe it was in my mind. But I felt that. I felt that, and I felt that when I, I, I went into the classroom. And you know, I, when I started teaching here in LA in 2015, I, I felt like some of those practices were starting to shift, but not so much. And uh, you know, again, it, I think it took a while, you know, for us to have these conversations. You know, I go to therapy as well to really think about what was happening inside of my like my spirit. But I definitely feel that as I started letting my guard down and seeing the potential for humanizing pedagogies in the way that we teach, that it started making more sense to me. It started making sense more. Even my writing started making more sense to me. Why am I doing this? Like. Like, from what perspective am I doing this? Who am I doing this for, right? I felt like all of those things were always external. I was always trying to prove someone right or wrong, right? Never myself, right? And I think those are those moments that really began to get highlighted when I started reflecting on just how I felt about myself, my self-esteem and these things like that, right? That I think I, I masked a lot through alcohol for a very long time. I think alcohol masked that pain for me and that I was like, you know, very quiet person. I still am a very quiet person. You know, you can tell from this podcast probably, but you know, in a, in a social setting and even in the classroom setting, it was like, I had to have everything formulated, right? Like step by step, almost minute by minute, like what's next, what's next in order for me to feel comfortable because I was never comfortable just going up there and be like, hey, let's talk, right? Because I didn't want to talk. I, I, I was afraid, right, to, to have myself reflected there. And I know now, right? And I, and I know now that that was making me very unhappy. And, and I think, you know, even in my day-to-day -day life, those things made me very unhappy. And I started thinking about, again, like alcohol being like, you know, lowering those inhibitions and, you know, oh, Danny's fun, he's a drunk, right? And, you know, Danny's talkative and he's cool when he's, when he's drinking, right? But again, that was, you know, one of those things that that when I wasn't drinking, I was afraid to open my mouth, right? And I think those are those things that, again, as I began to reflect and let go of those, you know, uh, those fears, right, of allowing others to see me for who I am, right, that I, I begin to think about, right, like, Oh, that's making me a better teacher, a better learner, a better writer, a better, you know, thinker almost, right? Because I'm I'm allowing myself to make mistakes. I'm allowing myself to be human. I'm allowing myself to be vulnerable and and see those things not like you mentioned before, not as a negative, right? I see those things as a learning experience, right? And I want that to be a part of my teaching style as well to be like look like it's okay for us to make mistakes you know it's not going to be the end of the world next time it's going to get better right next time it's going to get better after that it's going to be even better after that it's going to get even better and it's going to get easier and easier right we're going to learn how to navigate these spaces together and, and we're going to get through this together right and i'm hoping that as this process as this podcast Right, and, and those who, who come and support, you know, this podcast, give us comments and thoughts, their own thoughts that we can continue to grow that community and uh, of, of growth and healing and vulnerability and, and say, you know what, like, maybe we don't have all the answers. Maybe we haven't been allowed in these spaces historically, right? Maybe, again, X, Y, and Z, we can have so many maybes and what ifs, right? But if we allow ourselves to see each other for where we're at, value each other, find peace and, and find this sense of, you know, community with one another in these spaces, 
I think, you know, the, the possibilities are boundless and infinite. Is there a piece of content that energizes you, sets the stage for your class, and or perhaps captures the gravity of a historical moment that you use at the beginning of the semester? Yeah, man. Um, I, I, um, I've always been a little hesitant to assign things that I've written before, uh, but um, over the summer, I wrote something that kind of speaks to what I what I commented on a little bit earlier and what you were commenting on right now, you know, which is about bringing ourselves into the classroom and bringing our stories into the classroom. And and I felt like I really needed to connect with students at the beginning of the fall. And I assigned uh, an essay I wrote called Luna Lovers um, in the beginning of the fall. And uh, I assigned it because it was, I was asked to write about my experiences in Minneapolis, Minnesota as a way to respond to the killing of, of the state sanctioned killing of George Floyd. And, uh, you know, I, I really like the fact that um, you, if you go to it, like you can play the song Luna Lovers. And uh, obviously I tell my experience, I talk about my experiences in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where you and I met and um, that to me was the safe, the safest place in Minneapolis when I was out there. It was being in your apartment. Y'all had the, the heat turned up. Uh, I think you've, you've recently told me that it wasn't on, it wasn't on purpose, right? <laughs> no, the thermostat was broken. <laughs> <laughs> it always kept, it always kept me in uh, Solheim warm shout out to Soham. um that's why i have such but, pure skin i was always sweating in there <laughs> <laughs> like a sauna um but when we would go over to your apartment after a long day of you know commuting to the university uh, y'all would put um, your son diego uh to sleep with that a lullaby essentially right uh, the song luna lovers and uh in the essay i talk about how much that song means to me because it helps me alchemize sonically sonically heal those memories it's almost like when i was asked to write that essay as i told you and reyna when i asked for permission to talk about that experience I was really in a headspace where I just wanted to talk about all the bad stuff that happened, you know, and I do talk about it in the essay, you know, you, me and Soham were escorted out of Target Field in <laughs> Minneapolis for cheering in Spanish. Uh, yes, El Puig, who was on the Dodgers at the time. I had some pretty kind of negative classes and racist experiences in, in you know, nightclubs and stuff like that. Uh, I write about all that stuff, negative experiences and in activist spaces too, that were predominantly white. And um, I was gonna go right into the misery, but that song started kind of, I really try to meditate when I was writing that essay, it started really coding my experience, right? Luna lovers, um, that there was actually something soothing about that. And it's in many ways, it helped me put that experience to bed, um, but also, you know, meditate and, and be conscientious that, you know, community, friendship, those were gonna be the experiences uh, that were going to generate um, a way out of um, this hell on earth that, that wrecks itself specifically on black folks and um, extends itself to uh, communities of color, uh, racialized and indigenous. And I assigned that essay because um, you know, I think now that I look back on it, it was trying to have students see that my experiences, but also see that we were going to use personal experiences as a vital part of the classroom, as uh, something that um, wasn't just going to be there for trauma purposes, but was going to be there for, um, you know, it, it's, it's potential to link us all together. Um, I talk about a childhood friend of mine that um, although I had 
lost some some contact with over the years. Uh, he was um, murdered by uh, the Whittier Police Department, um, Jonathan. And um, when the Black Lives Matter protests came to Whittier, well, where I currently live, uh, folks in those protests were honoring, you know, his life along with the life of George Floyd. And uh, it was a really important moment for me uh, to see that, to see him being acknowledged after I had kind of been really silent about it since it happened. And um, he was he was murdered a few years ago, um, but his head bashed and uh, asphyxiated by the Whittier Police Department. And, and um, what that what that essay kind of reminded me was, you know, that essentially, unfortunately, Jonathan, without consent, and George Floyd were now ancestors, right? Um, and we're, we're 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 potential friends that you know we never cross necessarily cross path with and, and won't, uh, but that they could be kind of a guiding light into how we understand the intimacies of racial violence, the intimacies of, of ableist violence. Um, Cause that was uh, Jonathan's story as well. Um, he was suffering from um, and living with um, some pretty serious mental health issues. And um, that's, he had not uh, that's what the sort of reason why the the rationalization for why folks called the police. Um, and and that, all those experiences, I started the semester with sharing them through that song, Luna Lovers. And, uh, you know, that song to me, you know, obviously reminds me of your son, right? It reminds me of Dedo uh, and him sleeping soundly. It reminds me of what I hope, you know, to model in, in my life with uh, being around young folks, being around, you know, kids as well. You know, all you want for them is to be safe. All you want them to feel like is that, you know, that, that the world is, is, is there for them to dream. Uh, and as, you know, the song talks about, right, that, you know, things can, we can move through this life gently. Um, it's a beautiful song to like think about how do how do we want to live in the world how do we want to be in the world and that song for me is that kind of piece of content that energizes me to be gentle and to be to be slow that we don't have to be so um you know particular about this type of actions that we take but gentleness and 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 uh, you know, the way that that song, if you get a chance to listen to it, is kind of lullaby. I love to, I now I'm, you know, I, I do share it in the beginning of my semesters. Um, I want them to kind of think of the class in that way. Um, to, to, to think about, you know, that dreaming still matters, that relaxing still matters, unwinding, you know. You know that song that helps you go to sleep because um, the world's cruel. Um, and I think of of how I can how my class in many ways is an effort to uh, kind of mimic that experience, mimic that kind of energy um, that they're going to come into the class. You know, with that as a, as a kind of sonic textbook, I, I guess. Yeah, is what would that? Do you have a piece of content, Danny, or like a, a story, or, or a piece of a writing, a piece of an essay that gravitates, or a song, or something that you bring in that kind of helps you set the stage for you know the gravity of all our historical moment? I do. I mean, there's a piece that I assign as basically first day reading once a practice the way that we're gonna approach writing and, and all that stuff in the class but also to kind of set the base basically for the way that we're gonna converse with one another um 
and how we're going to use conversation as a a means of learning and teaching one another. Piece is called Conversations. It's by Bell Hooks, um, and I love that piece because it it really speaks to the importance of of how historically, right before this enlightenment, right kind of of, of the state and quote unquote enlightenment. Um, how folks have learned, right? And it was usually through word of mouth, right? And and in the essay, they discuss, right, how, you know, their personal experiences of, of uh, being in school and they're like, you know what, like, lecture was one thing, but I felt like I learned more, right, afterwards when I was talking to my peers, right? And um, that, is, that is a big, pedagogical kind of stance that I want to take in every classroom, right? You know, not everybody learns that way. So I try to be flexible and, 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 and use, you know, uh, various styles in, in my teaching uh, practices. But always, you know, I always make space for that because I feel like, you know, especially in the community, um, you know, community of color who has historically used uh, word of mouth history through you know to to um, as a knowledge base like I, I feel like it has been working you know very well um, I allow spaces for those students who want to be individuals and do all those things as well but I always go back to that and I always go back to that conversations piece as you know basically our foundation to to really create, right, this kind of community of scholars, if you will, right, um, this community where I always tell my students too, like, you know what, like, when I was in your space, right, especially when I was in community college and right out of high school, I signed up that first summer, I didn't take a break, right, I was like, I had a goal, I was like, I want, I want to get a degree in Chicano studies, right, back in the day when it's just Chicano studies. And I fell in LA. Like I said, I barely graduated high school, so I had to go to a community college. You know, and most of my friends were like, you know, that that barely graduated with me were like, I would be like, hey, how about we go study? And it's like, how about we go to the club? And then I ended up in the club trying to study, and it didn't work out very well for me. But you know, it took it took me a while to really think about right as as I you know, got into, you know, my BA and MA programs and, and created, you know, basically like almost a little cohort with like folks like, you know, uh, Carla Padron, shout out to Carla, you know, Michaela Marius, shout out to Mika, Steven Osuna, shout out to Luis Ramirez, shout out to Luis as well, right, that, you know, we created this community that, that really helped to, to, to guide, you know, me specifically. I mean, from I, I felt like, you know, these folks. I felt like, you know, I mean, and again, this part of my, my self consciousness, but I felt like I was a dumbest one in that group. But <laughs> you know, uh, you know, it, it, it really helped to for me to really think about, right, uh, how we were all, you know, uplifting one another, right? How we were all kind of in this community, going through the same thing together, right? Um, you know, and and. and yeah, we did our, our fair share of partying as well, but we did our work, right? We And again, that really helped me to, to kind of promote that as well. And I share that with my students as well. I'm just like, hey, look, all y'all are going, you know, going, specifically right now in this classroom are all going through the same thing. Like, support one another, right? Let's get away from the idea that academia is this individualistic, right, endeavor, right? That the way you succeed is by going into the like the top floor of the library in this very secluded area and you know you read the entire book and now you're an enlightened person let's get away from that right especially when we're working with communities that have historically relied on one another to create knowledge right and ancestral knowledges right and 
I love that piece. I love that piece because it, it really highlights that sense of, you know, communal learning, this, this sense of really being there for one another and, and to, to succeed in that way that again, in this nation has historically told us like, don't go to your community for knowledge, forget that, forget your languages, forget your cultures, forget, you know, everything that you think your parents might have to contribute to your education, throw that out the window. And I feel like this piece really challenges that, that historical kind of narrative that we've been taught in this nation. And, and, and again, it says quite the opposite. It says, you know, no, every one of them can contribute to your education. Every one of them has a say in your success, right? And that's go back to those roots. Thank you for sharing your time and inviting us into your day here at the Alchemist Manifesto. We invite you to check out our next episode. We're putting together a playlist on Apple and Spotify of songs referenced or discussed on the podcast. If there's a song that this podcast inspired you to listen to, please let us know because we'd love to add it to our playlist. Or feel free to share your thoughts, responses, and questions via direct message or on Instagram at The Alchemist Manifesto or via email alchemistmanifesto at gmail.com. You can also leave us a voice message if you're listening to us on the Anchor app. We'd love to hear from you. A reminder that if you ever feel stuck, from the mud grows the lotus. Special shout out to Jaime E. Talavera for the musical intro and Joel Ureña Mora for your work on our social media. We appreciate you both. We also thank Terrell Webb, Radio Pocho, Manuel Bermudez, Andres Alba Cardenas, Adriana Basulto, and Isabel Hirora for sharing the podcast. Sending healing energy to Letty and Rocco. Love you too.